Uh, our next speaker is not, as you might have thought, Professor Dr. Ulrich Poschler, who cannot be with us, but Ralph Schimmer of the Max Planck Digital Library, who's going to um, give, I think, uh, his talk and also one of, uh, one of his own about the perspectives after the Berlin 12 meeting on open access, which, as many of you know, was a closed meeting. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, when I woke up this morning, I was not aware that I would be standing here at that point in time in front of you as the last obstacle before lunch. Um, it was just a few minutes before the start of this conference that I learned that I had to step in for Ulrich Pöschler. So I had to improvise a little bit with my slides. I put together what I believe is a coherent presentation, but the graphical representation of the slides is not fully coherent. So it's, it's, a, it's putting together uh, different graphical elements, but I think that's probably acceptable. But this already tells you something. So from the Max Planck Society, we are not only one person able to step in and to present this narrative that we want to present to the uh, global research community and also the publishing industry that we think that the open access transformation of the scientific uh, journal publishing system is badly needed. We think it is needed to depart from the subscription uh, system as much as we can and arrive in a truly open access uh, world based on truly open access business models. So the key idea behind our uh, transformation initiative is that when we look at the open access debate so far, and uh, uh, I just want to remind you that it was the Max Planck Society that initiated the Berlin Conference back in 2003 with the Berlin Declaration, and there have been follow-up conferences ever since almost on an annual basis. And when we look at this track record of 12 years, we can, we can see that there was a, a, a lot of activities have initiated. We have reached a lot of a level of awareness and also practical measures. You can now look at it, whether the glass is half full or half empty. But what many of these initiatives and, and pushes share is that in a way they wanted to make the researcher behave in a certain way. We think we can look at the last 12 years as a, as a story of uh, trying to, to uh, bring the researcher to open access. We think we, we, are, we have the opportunity now, and it is also badly needed, that we shift gears here. We think finally it is open access that should be brought to the researcher and not the other way around. And in the essence is, we want to provide open access in all the areas where the researchers yeah, are active in their day-to-day -day behavior. Namely, that is where they submit their articles to. They go, and for many good reasons, career considerations, first of all, they go to the uh, known and prestigious journals. And this is, we think that we have to target these journals as well as, as all the others, of course, as well, and to flip to them to an open access model. So, and uh, in trying to stage the transformation, we published a paper in April last year that in which we try to demonstrate, first of all, the financial viability of such a large-scale transformation. Uh, we also started ourselves with pilots, and we, we, uh, we also closely follow the pilots under the name of offsetting models that are done in other countries, predominantly in the Netherlands, in the UK, and also in the Scandinavian countries, uh, to, to reconsider the publisher relations and to uh, improve or bring new target definitions to the license negotiations. And we want to build a large international coalition and to develop a transition plan. 
And uh, Philip Terhagen just mentioned how difficult it is to address the res uh, uh, officials in China or the decision makers in the United States. Uh, we also see this, I mean, and this is also what we work on. We think we have a chance also to convince the institutions and individuals in the United States as well as in the Asian countries that they will finally also see the merits of basing the pu publishing system finally on a true open access business model. And what it's about here, uh, what this will involve is uh, embodied in this slide. We've heard this in the first presentations about scenarios and uh, uh, science 2.0 kind of considerations. So we, th we think that the core functions of publishing, how they are, have been described very often, the, the registration, certification, dissemination, and perhaps the archival record, there's a debate with the libraries who, who is really responsible for this. And then you have broader services that are under constant debate, improvement, et cetera. That is the universe of where scholarly communication can, should, or perhaps must evolve into. We believe we can draw a line and, and see that the cash flow system as such that funds everything is not necessarily an inherent function of any of the elements ab above here. So we think the underlying business model can be detached, isolated, and targeted by itself. At the moment, we are confronted with a dominant cash, uh, read access cash flow, that is the subscription system, that is, as we all know, inherently restricted in use and reuse rights. So the task that we see in front of us, that we really target this underlying business model and organize a flip of the system and turn it into a dominant publication service-based cash flow system a truly open access system. That is the goal that we've been articulating. We know when you articulate such a goal, there are many challenges. It's counterintuitive to the experience and knowledge of many, probably even most people, in the places of authority, the library directors, the head of the acquisition departments in libraries, and with them, of course, then the presidential level at the academic institutions in the universities and other institutions. That's the data that are typically at hand in those institutions are not sufficient enough. And so the, this was the goal and the rationale behind our data publication that we did last year, that we wanted to demonstrate both the financial viability and also give the data uh, that uh, the publishing data of all countries of the world, including the corresponding author share, which is the, uh, the vital instrumental side of where the funding under an APC model will be organized uh, according to. So these were the two publications. I, gave the DOI so that you can retrieve them in, in case you have not seen them or you are not aware. So it's not only this white paper, there's a second publication that was a data publication. It contains 10 years of global publishing data of all the countries together with their corresponding author shares. And this data tells you already something by itself, but which I'm not uh, specifying here for, for the purpose of time. So what we think we could demonstrate clearly that such a shift is financial, financially feasible in the first place. We, our claim is, and we think it's based on a sound data analysis, is that there is already sufficient money in the system to finance the results of scholarly communication also in an open access world. These are the mechanics as we presented and elaborated them in our publication uh, of last April. So these are known figures. The total spending of the libraries of the world for scientific journals is in the range of 7.6 billion euro. 
these are figures that, of course, we are not able to yeah, c collect ourselves, but these are figures that are published in more than one financial reports. There are the market anal analysts such as uh, Simba or BNP Paribas. There is STM uh, with their annual reports, etc., et and, and other publications that mention a figure. They are not always fully identical, but they are at least always in that range. So this is a figure that can be taken as a sound analysis. In terms of the, what, is, what is this money financing as an output, when you look at only what is captured in the web of science, then it was for, the, for 2014 uh, almost exactly 1.5 million articles. When you look at the number of articles that are also published but not listed in the web of science, of course there are, there are many assessments uh, most uh, center around the assessment that it's in the range of two million articles overall. When you look at the money and the, and the publishing numbers, then you can see that in the current system, we already pay 5,000 euros if we only look at the Web of Science share of the publications. If we look at the total share of 2 million, then it's still 3,800 articles over uh, uh, euros per article overall. When we transfer this and, and assume the world would already be open access, we start with a price point of 2,000 euros average per article. I will say a little bit more about an average APC price point in, in the next few slides. Um, but I want to remind you, because I, I, I would assume that there are several people here in the room who think that this might be too low. I will just remind you, when you look at, at countries and their population and the uh, demographics there, I mean, you can have many 100-year-old seniors in your country and still have an average age of, let's say, 35 or 40 years. So single, very high price points are not counterintuitive to an average. The average over 2 million will also include a lot of long tail, low profile, low cost kind of articles. So 2,000 is, in terms of an average, already a, a, a pretty high number. When you multiply this by two, the 2 million research articles that we have, then you come up with a total estimation of 4 billion euros. That's comfortably within the current spending level, and it provides already a substantial buffer for improving the services. We would anticipate and assume that the publishing services will differentiate, will differentiate its themselves fairly significant from what we have at the moment. So the publishing will be just perhaps for organizing the peer review and doing the publication and some marketing services or uh, um, um, reputation building services may, might differentiate themselves uh, and, and be detached and as an optional component on, on the side. So there, there is room for improvement and differentiation of the system. And so we, we are making the claim that an open access transformation seems to be possible without uh, a major financial risk. Um, these are now a few slides on, on the current APC levels. We have the example of Scope 3, which has been around and in, in, in operation since the publishing year 2014. Um, the report here is that they operate on well below uh, 100, uh, 1,100 euros uh, per paper. The Austrian Science Fund, the Wellcome Trust, have for at least two years uh, uh, given annual reports on their APC evidence. And there is also recently, since last year, the German Open APC Initiative 
that uh, uh, publishes APC evidence in a GitHub system. It also has some graphical uh, uh, elements uh, and they will be improved soon. Um, and this is just uh, capturing the result. So the, the uh, average that is being documented on this system at the moment is an average fee of $1,237 uh, euros, excuse me. Uh, I can say that this is almost exactly the average uh, that we observe in the Max Planck Digital Library ourselves. And we've been supporting open access publications since more than 10 years and we've built up a lot of data points and evidence. And when we look at the development over the, the years, this is a fairly consistent picture that we can observe and monitor. So the exercise in front of us is that we are here confronted with the big block of subscription journals and their content and a, a, a large spending block. And on the other hand, we have an open access volume that has reached 13% in 2013. Philip Terhagen just mentioned 17%, but he included the hybrid component. These are based only on really pure open access gold publications and, uh, in, uh, and, and not the, the hybrid uh, part of the, of the thing. And we think as long as we cannot shift journals and the money from that side to the other side, the open access part will come as additional money and it will not affect the journals that are organized and locked in the subscription regime. So. The exercise is really to shift the journals together with their spendings from the left side, from the subscription side to the right side, which in this case is the open exercise. And you see again uh, the, the same the monetary figures and the calculations that you've seen in the other slide before. The other novel element that we introduced through our publication last year was that many cost projections that were presented at conferences in the last years were based on fairly naive and false understanding of the data. The publishing data that's been recorded in the bibliographies or institutional repositories of the research organizations of the universities, etc., have to de de have to be deduplicated. So more and more research is being co-authored and uh, the co-authors come from a variety of in institutions. So they are listed in the bibliographies of all of their home institutions, but in terms of paying for the publishing service, the paper has to be paid only once. It can be recorded five times or even 10 times or even more, but in terms of the payment, it has to be uh, uh, counted only once. And so in this column, you see for the three selected countries over a 10 year period, always the corresponding author share, that's always the darker part of the columns. And you can observe this, and this is the data that's been published uh, also for, for all the countries and for the global scale. And you can see that in no single case in those countries, the level of corresponding authors on the country level ever exceeded the 70% margin for those countries. When you look at countries like, such as China and the United States who are larger and more insular for many reasons, some of them good reasons, then the share of corresponding author papers is higher. And for countries that are smaller and less research intensive, this share is even lower. So there's, they, they, not all countries would have the same corresponding author share in their papers, but this can all be looked and analyzed in our data publication. But that's, that's core for making the cost projection. And I will give you now two sl slides with cost projections both for Germany and the UK. 
And you could see here the, the, the total publication, and these are the corresponding author shares, Germany and the UK. I go to the UK, you see they have almost exactly the same uh, number of, of uh, papers. That's only <laughs> um, uh, less than 1,000 difference. And then you can make the, the calculation with the 2,000 assumed margin or the current evidence that we have in Germany. And you can make the cost projection what Germany would have to put up for the entire journal output as we have it at the moment. And from our national licensing working groups and all the data that we have at hand there, we know that our current spending in the countries is above the, the figures that you see here. The same is true for the UK. In the UK, the spendings of GIST collections and have been published in, in, in various uh, occasions. And also the Research Councils UK have uh, published their spending levels for the journals. And you can see there also that the UK is spending significantly more. In fact, they spend way beyond 200 million euros at the moment. At least that's what they report. Um, this slide, I don't want to go into the details at all. This is just to show you that there are many initiatives, particularly in Europe, if, as you are aware. They are not exhaustive here, and I don't want to mention them all. It, it's just a message. We think we are not alone. There are many. Uh, but they lack perhaps a common goal definition. And I think the notion of the transformation as presented to you here could become and adopted the common goal for the many initiatives. Here's again a, a variety of initiatives. These are the very recent ones. There was the Leru statement with a nice title, Christmas is over. Um, and the, as you are aware, I'm sure the Dutch presidency of the EU Council uh, has announced that they want to put open access to research publications also fairly high on their agenda. So there will be uh, uh, meetings uh, in, the, in the first half of, year, uh, of this year uh, to push this for forward. Um, I'm almost finished. Um, it's, so we, we uh, the second key event that we had after publishing this uh, white paper in the spring was the last Berlin conference, Berlin 12, which uh, was on the 8th and 9th of December in Berlin. And it was an international meeting with 100 delegates from 19 countries plus a handful of international organizations, such as the European Commission, for instance. So the results from that conference is, first of all, that there is an expression of interest, which I have a slide on in a moment. And the second, that is more or less to address the political support and to seek international uh, institutional signatures to the document. And the second result was a roadmap that is an action plan to specify what can be done on the local institutional level in order to prepare for such a, a fairly big leap and the departure from the existing practice. The expression of interest is not out in the public domain yet. At the moment, it's only circulated among the conference participants. So that's the, we are working on the very final version of the document, but it will be published soon. Um, and then signatures will be solicited beyond the Berlin 12 participants. Um, and it's already defined that uh, there will also be an outreach to the publishing industry. So uh, publishers are also invited to sign this e expression of interest, to share this goal, and to join in uh, in, the, in the definition of the next steps. So the, the, in a way, the expression of interest is, is saying in, in, on one page, 
similar things as I've said to you uh, in this presentation, so I'm not uh, repeating this here. Um, I want to end with a few pictures. On, I apologize for the, for the low resolution. They are not very good, I, but uh, I could not get better uh, pictures uh, just so spontaneously. This is Ulrich Perschel. He's the one who would have uh, uh, spoken to you. Um, and you can see this is a group picture, uh, an impression of the room, and you see that people were really concentrating hard and, and working hard during the two days of the conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Now, we are running very short of time, but I can't believe there aren't people who want to make a comment. I mean, my first comment is it's great, speaking with my STM hat on here, that publishers would be invited to sign it. It's a great shame they weren't invited to the meeting. Um, so, yes. Just very briefly, um, did you, uh, Ralph, over here. <laughs> Hi, this is Ben. Just very briefly, in your cost calculations, did you um, take into account green open access costs, um, institutional repositories? Because, of course, the reality is that we have a duality um, of green and gold open access, which probably won't go away in the near future. And I think the hidden costs of, of institutional repositories is, is not to be forgotten in this. Uh, there, there are many more hidden costs. So, so, and uh, uh, for instance, the UK is is uh, preferring to uh, uh, work on what they call the total cost of publishing, and and they look only at the, at the, the the hybrid cost and the subscription cost. I mean, uh, when you look at the reality. Things such as page charges, color charges have not disappeared. So, so when you when you really want to address the hidden costs, so you have to paint a fairly large and comprehensive picture, and it's very hard to get at really uh, uh, reliable, aggregated, like on a country or global level fi figure. So we all know that there is still a substantial additional cost element but we don't want to waste our time in trying to, and efforts to, to get at those numbers. We know that they are there and they are significant, but we cannot quantify them. Um, so, uh, okay, Anthony Watkins from Cyber Research. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Ralph, as you know very well, is why you hold closed meetings. Publishers don't hold closed meetings. They're not frightened of you coming along and talking to them. But you hold closed meetings to discuss policies and then ask other people to comment on them or sign them up. Hmm. Yes, we, we, we are aware of such postings, but we, we don't really understand this. Let, let me remind you all here that the first Berlin conference was also an invitational workshop. It was not a conference where people just could register. And I think when you are at a moment where you think you have to really discuss with, with, uh, with your fellow institutions whether the, your idea is something that the others think is a good one that, and you want to test the temperature. I mean, you, if, if you have it like an open uh, uh, registration thing, then you have just another conference. And I think that this is an, a, a normal and understandable and, and a fully uh, uh, legitimate instrument. There will be follow-up meetings that will, that will be more open. And I, as I said, as we want to reach out to the publishers, we will also have, have uh, the ne next meetings uh, that, that will involve the publisher representatives as well. We have a co from the front here, Stuart. Do you want to take my mic? Yeah, we've now had three mentions of the fact this was a closed meeting, but um, you know the meeting that, or the meetings I held at the Royal Society last year were also closed. They were invitation only, so I don't think I got the same sort of level of stick for that. So I suspect that's more about the politics than anything else. place to place, as if that's easily done. But each participant in the market is paying a certain amount for information at this time. How did you take it, and it's, you're, look, you're actually introducing new asymmetries in paying if you move from consumption payments to production payments. 
Did you talk at all about that? Did you see a path to doing that? Do you have any confidence that the asymmetries would be addressed? That people who aren't paying that much now would be willing to pay so much more? And that those who are paying would be happy to get rid of their burden? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, yes, we are aware that there will be asymmetries. When you look, when you look at the global level, it works. When you look at the country level, it will work in most countries. But when you break it down to the institutional level, then you might discover, and in some countries more and in others less, some smaller, some bigger, you will, you will discover these asymmetries. But we think the first thing is that uh, that and that's part of the roadmap that institutions shall really improve their grip on the data so that they are aware on both their publishing records and also their spending records and then they can make the calculation this would be already an achievement if we have a level of aware awareness that is not yet common there are hardly libraries in the world who would be able to just pull out those numbers and, and reports. So that's, that's the first thing. So, so improved awareness. And from there, ingenuity can set in and, and you, can, you can work in your system. I think in the continental European setting where you have more uh, government involvement than in other parts of the world, I mean, then you can, you can address the problem at, on this level. In the United States, this surely will be a bit more difficult. But the United States is full of smart people with a lot of ingenuity. So I would be optimistic that they can find a, a recipe uh, and the mechanics for working with this challenge in, in, in the country. If we don't uh, have hopes that a system can be changed even if it involves difficulties, then we should not get out of bed in the morning. Thank you very much to Ralph. <laughs> uh, and, and particularly for taking this on at such short notice. Um,